So good morning and thank you everybody for showing up at this early hour. So <clears throat> the tabloid title of this talk is The Rise and Fall of Internet Voting in Norway. Uh, and I'm going to tell the story about, some, uh, about the Norwegian trial, try to do internet voting right. So how, how many of you were at uh, Alex Holderman's great talk on Sunday on e-voting in Estonia? Quite a few. So you know already everything about internet voting. <laughs> so there are basically two kinds of voting systems. Uh, it's the kind of voting system you use to tell what is the best of Coca-Cola and Pepsi. And it's the kind of voting system you use to decide who do you want to be in government. And for the, for, for the second kind of voting system, uh, the stakes are a lot higher. And this is a fundamental uh, democratic ceremony, and it's really important that we get it right and we make sure that it stays democratic and secure and fair. And so this talk is going to be in three main parts. I'm going to talk about the internet voting trial that was held in Norway in 2013. And then I'm going to give the historical background for that trial to try to look at how was it that we did this trial in Norway and what happened afterwards and what was, what, what was the story. Uh, and then finally I'm going to talk about my own work uh, auditing the crypto implementation uh, used for the voting system. And so there are really three main points to take away from this. And I think the first point is that even though internet voting is uh, scary and something which uh, I think we don't want, uh, the Norwegian trial really tried to do it right. In the sense that they wanted to make it, uh, they wanted to conduct a really open trial and be very honest and upfront about what they were doing. Uh, the second point is that uh, this kind of event is not only about technology, it's also very much about politics. And you find that uh, even though the hackers are saying internet voting, no, we don't want this. Uh, it's a very, uh, there are a lot of other forces in play which uh, shape what's, what's actually going on. And so, you might want to ask, why would, anyone, why would anybody want to do internet voting at all? And I think uh, the main argument uh, 10 years ago, which was definitely pre-Snowden, and when we were, I think, as a whole, a bit more naive about the threats online, was that uh, I can do banking online, I can do my taxes online, why can't I vote? And so some of the formal goals of the project was to uh, improve accessibility for marginal groups and uh, to make the voting experience better for people who are not voting in their home location, such as students. And at the beginning of the trials, they also wanted to increase turnout, but internet voting in the experiment didn't really seem to have an effect on that. And uh, finally, I think that from a purely uh, technical or scientific point of view, this is kind of an interesting challenge. So we want to, see, we want to learn something about uh, if, if we try to do this, what, what are the actual roadblocks, uh, both uh, technologically and from a democratic point of view. And so <clears throat> I guess some of you might wonder who is this tour guy and why, why am I here speaking about this? Uh, well, I did my I did a PhD in cryptography uh, quite a few years ago. Uh, I'm working currently as an IT, IT security consultant at uh, a security company in Oslo, Norway, and this is my sixth time at CCC. Uh, actually, I've been playing with computers since uh, since forever. I got I got my first Unix account when I was four uh, to play NetHack. Uh, and I guess I sort of stayed along those lines for quite some time. Uh, my own role as regards to internet voting in Norway is that I wasn't, I, I've not been a part of the voting project, but uh, I did this crypto audit for them in 2013. And uh, 
Because the project has been so open, uh, everything I'm saying here is based on public information, uh, but some of it is subject to my own interpretation or understanding uh, based on the fact that I was outside the project itself. So, Norway. I guess uh, not everybody knows a lot about Norway. It's up here. <laughs> it's a northern European country. It's quite small, five million people. Uh, it's a stable and rich democracy, which has a really tremendous amount of public trust. So, so people are trustful, maybe even to a fault of both their neighbors and, the, and of the government. <laughs> And I think, uh, in this sense, Norway has a lot of preconditions for doing this kind of internet voting experiment. Uh, it's a pretty small country, it's a pretty small trial. Uh, it's politically very stable, so if, if, if something really went wrong, uh, it, wouldn't, uh, it would be possible to recover in a, in a stable manner. Uh, in fact, uh, there was, uh, in 2011, there was a terror attack against the government uh, only a few weeks before the election and before the first internet voting trial, in fact. And uh, we were st still able to carry, uh, to carry out the election under reasonably ordinary uh, circumstances. Uh, and finally, uh, Norway can afford to do it right. Uh, so, and I think these are really preconditions for a successful experiment. So, if anybody is able to do internet voting, it should be us, right? <coughs> and so, uh, the overall concept for internet voting in Norway. This is not electronic voting machines, it's online voting from your laptop, from your living room. And so, uh, as a voter, you are able to log on and vote online as many times as you want. And the internet voting is only done before election day. And on election day, you can go to a polling place and you can vote physically as well. And the system is uh, integrated in such a way that uh, only the last vote counts. And this is meant as uh, sort of one of the main anti-vote selling, anti-coercion uh, techniques in this system that even if somebody forces you to vote for whatever, then you can go and you can vote again, either, e either online or at the polling place. Uh, the, second the second idea here is that you use a fancy cryptographic protocol which you try to say something uh, fundamental about. So you're trying to get some pretty strong uh, guarantees that the core protocol you're using is actually uh, sound and that's what you want. And the system was uh, designed, at least in principle, to give end-to-end -end security, which meant that you were supposed to have no trust between, between each element in the processing chain of a vote. And you would, you would use cryptographic proofs to, to link everything together. And similarly, there was uh, quite a bit of separation of duties, such that the fact that encryption keys were split in half and given to two different people so that they would both have to collude to, uh, to use the key. Uh, the final part of the concept is that the voters get some out-of-band feedback about the result of their online vote, which uh, the voter, but only the voter, uh, can use to verify that the vote posted online was, was the vote that he intended to to cast. And so, and so this sounds pretty reasonable, I guess. But then you get into the technical details. And so for, for a voting system, you want strong authentication because you want to know who voted. And you want to be able to make sure that people voting multiple times are ma matched up correctly so that uh, you, ca you count the right votes in the end. So the authentication system needs to be secure. And then at the same time, you want to have anonymous ballots. So you shouldn't be able to link uh, the vote over here with the person who cast it online. And the third requirement is that you want to be able to verify afterwards uh, the, the result of the election. And so those, uh, those three 
uh, requirements are actually kind of uh, opposing each other because it means that you need to have some sort of separation between different processing stages in such a way that you can't link this together again. And there's really a fourth uh, security requirement which is not clearly stated here, and that's about verifiability. And what does that really mean? Because in a traditional paper ballot vote, uh, there is a lot of weaknesses, limitations, and there's an, quite a high cost of running a paper election. But uh, the threat model is pretty well understood, and it's got high le legitimacy. And you can more or less explain to a five-year-old that, yeah, you, you are putting ballots in this box here, and it's locked, and then uh, people from different parties come and count it together, and so they make sure that there are checks and balances, and there are a lot of people involved in, in making this happen. Uh, and uh, make and realizing that kind of requirement in an electronic high-tech system using fancy crypto is uh, kind of hard. And that's, I think that's really one of the fundamental challenges about electronic voting and internet voting is that you need to make it so transparent as you possibly can. And I'm not sure we know how to do that yet. And so there's a fourth security requirement on the list here, which is the ability to, to detect attacks. And one of the main goals of the internet voting pilot in Norway was that uh, even if there is some kind of attack on the system, uh, then at least if it's affecting a lot of votes, then we need to be able to detect it. And we might be able to live with the effects of some kind of small scale abuse uh, in the sense that below a certain threshold, uh, that might be unavoidable no matter how you implement an election. But there should, we should be able to detect any kind of large-scale fraud attempts and, if necessary, just or just rerun the election a few weeks later if, if, if there's found evidence of some kind of large-scale abuse. And so I think uh, already, already at this point we realize that uh, if for an internet system we are probably not going to be able to make it 100% bulletproof, uh, people are going to have malware, uh, people are going to get hacked. But at least at some level uh, it should be uh, possible to de detect anything going on. <clears throat> and so there are also quite a few counter arguments against uh, internet voting in particular and I guess also electronic voting in general. Uh, <coughs> Transparency and verifiability, as we just talked about, is uh, difficult to solve. Uh, the main argument in the public debate in Norway has been around coercion and the fact that you are voting in an uncontrolled environment uh, rather than in a public, uh, at a public polling place in a closed booth. And there's also been a claim in the, pu in the public debate that internet voting debases uh, the, the ceremonial as aspect of going to vote. And I don't know if... I, I don't know uh, how widely that applies, but at least, uh, at least for some people, going to the poll is... Kind of, is this democratic ceremony that they value quite highly, and basically being able to vote from your sofa is undermining that. And that's, I think, also a fair, a fair argument. In, in the initial um, risk analysis that, that were being done, uh, threats like hacking were considered in general, but I think uh, specific threat agents were considered to a lesser degree. Uh, Awareness of the nation state kind of threats has prob probably incre increased over the last few years. And Norway as a country has had quite poor diplomatic relations with China. And we have a border with Russia and uh, you might think that somebody would want to do, uh, try to influence the outcome of a vote and that's clearly a threat 
to an online system. So I mentioned the cryptographic protocol. I'm not going to go very deeply into that because then we could spend an hour just talking about the crypto. And that's a lot of fun for a crypto geek like me, but uh, it might be a bit narrow. Uh, from the cryptographic literature, this is a reasonably uh, standard voting protocol. Uh, it uses uh, Algamal encryption, and it uses uh, actually the homomorphic, uh, uh, the homomorphic property of the Algamal crypto system to make computations on encrypted ballots. So basically, they encrypt the, they encrypt the voters' uh, vote intent with uh, Algamal, and then they use they do further computations on the encrypted ciphertexts and. Uh, to, to do some transforms and to, to mask what's going on. And then between each um, step in the processing chain, the system uses Schnorr signatures or, or Schnorr-based uh, zero-knowledge proofs to ensure that everything is, is uh, correct. And then there's a mixed network uh, at the end, which is used to <clears throat> basically separate, uh, separate the voter from the ballot. Uh, they also use Shamir secret sharing to split encryption keys, again to make sure that multiple operators uh, have to collude, that, that you don't have a single operator who sits on the key. And the protocol is pretty well described. It's been analyzed by, by Christian Jösten in some public papers. Uh, there's nothing... Uh, uh, there's nothing really bad there. It's, it's, I think it's a good protocol. And so we come to the election trial in uh, 2013. And uh, <clears throat> the voting trial happened in 12 municipalities out of 428. And they're marked in green on the map here. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, which meant that there were about 250,000 voters who cast uh, about 70,000 ballots over the net. And the, the, the web page looked, well, the starting page looked like this. It's in Norwegian. It says that there's a column on the left which explains a bit about the internet voting. And then there's information about how to vote and how to log in. There's a link to a video. And there's some information about uh, the vote being secret. And you should, you should make sure that you're in a private place when you are casting a vote online. And so the authentication for this system is based on existing public infrastructure using two-factor authentication, either with SMS or a hardware token. And then there's a there are actually two feedback mechanisms uh, for the voter. Uh, when after casting a vote online, you get an, you get an SMS code, which is I think a four-digit number or a six-digit number, uh, which you can verify against a list of codes which is written on, uh, on, your, uh, on your voting card, which is a card that you, you get in the mail. And, and so this, this link here is actually one of the fundamental um, security assumptions that this document with the code cannot be linked to the SMS code, cannot be linked to the person. Uh, you in the web interface itself, it also gives you uh, a SHA-256 hash of, uh, of your encrypted vote. And uh, the idea was that a signed list of SHA-256 hashes would be published to, to, to GitHub during counting. Which meant that during counting, you could actually go online and verify, or verify that your hash was in the list if you wanted to. And so this is all a web app running on GNU Linux. I think it was CentOS. It's a, it's a Java application on the back end. Uh, in 2013, the front end was all uh, HTML and JavaScript. So there was quite a bit of JavaScript uh, crypto going on there. Uh, the project had a few additional safeguards. So I already talked about the feedback mechanism to the voter, which was the return codes and the ballot hashes. Uh, they also had election monitors to, to shadow the system operators and to make and to basically follow them around and see what they were doing. Uh, I guess uh, a drawback uh, of that approach is that uh, the election monitors don't necessarily know what 
the operator is typing into the system on the, on the command line uh, because the interface is kind of complicated. Um, the source code is, all the source code for the election system is public. It's under a proprietary license uh, owned by the government, but at least it's, they published it online. Uh, and they had quite a few third-party uh, contractors to, to audit the solution. Uh, there was a web app security test of the front end. Uh, there was the external review of the crypto, which was uh, my job. And there was actually an independent uh, third-party implementation of the vote counting module, which meant that on election day, they were they had two independent implementations of the counting system, which were running in parallel on the same data. And, and so the idea was that uh, if somebody tried to tamper with one of the counting systems, they hopefully shouldn't uh, be able to, to sabotage the other, the other one as well. And then the entire technical system was also monitored using, using Splunk, which meant that the local logs were being collected continuously to, to a different system in a different security zone. So, so they had been thinking quite a bit about this. And then... Uh, Five days before the election, there was a critical bug. <laughs> and so, so the text here says, this is from, uh, this is from a Norwegian newspaper, and it says there's, a, there's an error in the encryption of the e-votes. And what actually happened was that the, encryption ball the encrypted ballots that the voter was sending uh, actually leaked information about the plain text uh, because of a bug. And uh, due to the layered security, uh, I mean, you were voting via SSL and the, or TLS, and and then the, the votes were stored uh, on on a, on a secure system. Hopefully, uh, it meant that uh, this information should not be leaking anyway. But uh, at least one of the security layers was quite badly broken, and it seems like a combination of luck and preparation made sure that. No votes were actually revealed, but it was a very close call. And we will get back to the cause of this bug uh, a bit later. Uh, and then what happened in 2014? Well, the project was ended. And the government decided that the government had uh, an evaluation by, uh, by political scientists focusing on the project goals, which were to increase availability and to, and to provide solutions tailored to young voters. And um, they found that internet voting was popular among the voters, uh, and the, but, but turnout did not really change, and the online, the online voters were quite similar to the voting population at large. <clears throat> and so the project was ended, and uh, the BBC posted a story about this a few, da a few days later, and it looked like this. Uh, and so the press release mainly highlighted the lack of cross-political will, but uh, it also said that most voters didn't have much knowledge about the security mechanisms in the system. And so the BBC framed it like this, and the government uh, didn't quite like that angle. It said that BBC misreports it. And so it's quite interesting what the Norwegian government says here. It says that Norway has a strong tradition of seeking consensus in all matters regarding electoral policy. Due to the lack of broad political will to introduce internet voting, blah, 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 the government decided not to continue expending public resources on the pilots. And I think uh, that's actually a completely honest statement. That uh, in, in the sense that internet voting was kind of controversial among the different parties. But there's also a very important subtext here, which is that after the 2013 elections, uh, there was a change of government. And so in 2014, when, when the evaluations were complete, uh, the main champions of this project were out of power. And so lack of, lack of broad political will, that's completely true. But I think it's also uh, important to note that it's also very politically expedient. Like, why do I want to spend money on my predecessor's expensive pet project? 
and that has nothing to do with technology, and it has, no, it, it has nothing to do with sort of the, the facts of the trial, but it's, it, it's convenient. I mean, you, you, can just throw it under, you can just throw it under the bus because uh, you, you have a nice excuse and you can use the money for something else. And so the next thing I'm going to look at is how did we actually get to this trial in 2013. And so this timeline here is not 100% exact, but it's, I think it's close enough to, to paint a picture of what's going on. So actually in 2004, uh, the, govern the government at the time started doing a feasibility study about electronic voting and online voting. But there wasn't really any uh, huge ent enthusiasm, as far as I know, about doing anything more about it at that time. Then in 2005, there was a parliamentary election and there was a new government where some of the parties in that, that was a coalition government of three parties and at least some of the parties were quite keen on internet voting. And then the ball sort of started rolling, they got some champions in government and they got this feasibility study back a year later. And so there was a project organization and everything went, went from there. So, so I've, I've, uh, I've been digging a bit in the, in the electoral manifests from, from 2005, and at least one of the parties said, uh, quote, it must be easier to vote, students and pupils must be able to vote on the place that they're studying, and it must be open for electronic voting over the internet, end quote. And so that was, the, that was in their party manifesto in 2005, and uh, apparently they managed to get, to get that ball rolling, because there were some people who were uh, keen on doing that. So in 2006 they got uh, the result of the feasibility study, uh, showing basically the state of the art in 2006. That was a 200 page report in Norwegian. It contained quite a lot of information about experiences from other countries, including Estonia. Uh, it also included a, a high-level threat assessment, uh, which apparently didn't consider state-backed actors, but it, it, it considered hacking in general, but again, this was 2004, 2005, 2006. Uh, the, study was, the study was circulated for comments, and in 2008, uh, the ball started rolling. So, they got some funding, they got a project organization, uh, they started specifying the use cases and the processes and, and the documentation that they wanted to implement. <clears throat> in 2009, they got a vendor after a public tender. Actually, they got two vendors in 2009 for various systems. Uh, the goal at this point was to make a pilot aiming for full internet voting by 2017. And so the initial, the initial version of this implementation was finished in, in the summer of 2011. So this is kind of funny because it's been a few years and then suddenly in 2010 people realized that, uh, hey, uh, we're going to have internet voting next year. This is, uh, this is kind of interesting. So, so, we, uh, so there, there finally was a bit of public debate, but at this point I think uh, the forces in motion were such that, in any case, there was going to be an experiment in 2011, because it was, it was already decided. So there were quite a few skeptical voices, and it's kind of interesting, because they didn't really split along uh, political lines. Uh, one, of the, one of the most well-known political scientists in Norway, who Professor Frank Orebrot, uh, who, who is a known supporter of the the government who was doing this uh, stated quite flatly that internet voting violates human rights. And, and his argument again was about voting under uncontrolled, uh, in an uncontrolled environment and under unclear circumstances. In, in any case, in 2011 we had the local elections. Uh, there were, uh, there were, of course, as as there always is in this kind of uh, <clears throat> in this kind of trial with a with a complicated technical system. There were a few bugs. Uh, some of the main problems were actually connected to these uh, return codes that were supposed to be printed on printed and sent by mail. Uh, 
uh, because there was uh, there, there were some misprints. And there was also the fact that uh, this terrorist attack happened six week, weeks before the, ele the elections and actually made, meant that the servers that were running uh, the trial election were actually closed off as, as part of the crime scene, uh, which uh, was kind of inconvenient because they needed to get to the servers. But in the end, uh, there were 27,500 people who voted over the net, and uh, it seemed to be an overall success. Uh, the studies showed that the e-voters were statistically quite similar to the voting public, except that they, when you are voting in Norway, you have some uh, options to modify the ballot to, in various ways. And the people who were voting online were actually a bit more active in making those modifications because it, it might be that it's easier to do it in an online environment than via pen and paper. And there were nine invalid votes, and I'm actually not sure how that happened, but at any rate, it's uh, quite a low number. Usually, I think, uh, I think they say that between, between half a percent or and two percent of votes or something uh, may, be, may be spoiled. So it's uh, so actually with, even with paper voting that that number is quite high. Uh, so after evaluating 2011, they decided to continue the project. Uh, this time with a single vendor. Um, they did. They made some technical improvements for bed randomization, among other things. Uh, they also re replaced the client, which in 2011 was a Java applet. And then they found out that Java applets are not really very cool anymore. <laughs> so in, in 2013, they decided to replace it with a brand new JavaScript crypto implementation because JavaScript crypto is really cool. <laughs> and so in, in 2013, we're back to where we started. There was a new election, this time in, in 12 municipalities. More than 70,000 votes cast online. And there was a change of government after, after eight years. And so, summing up this bit, I think there were some things that went quite right in this trial. Uh, the system seems to have worked very well technically in the sense that it's, it, was, uh, it didn't have any significant trouble with, with performance or downtime. Uh, there were few spoiled invalid or invalid ballots. Uh, there, was a, there was quite a lot of audit log verification, which did not show anything going wrong. And the system proved to be quite popular in, in the areas that actually used it. So, so there were several problems along the way, but at least nobody discovered any, anything that they really, really hadn't thought about. And On the other hand, there are also quite a few difficult areas. Uh, there, is, uh, there is a trade-off between security and sort of verifiabil verifiability and testability. Like the fact that it was quite hard to, uh, it was quite hard to provide runtime monitoring for some of the systems because, uh, because of security concerns. Uh, the voting cards and return codes, so the physical artifacts caused a few problems. Uh, key management and separation of duties is always hard. Uh, one of the really important aspects here is the voter understanding of security mechanisms and the ability to verify what's going on. And one, one thing which was noted was that quite few people uh, were very di diligent about checking the return codes, and even fewer people were, would actually go to the step of trying to verify the, the SHA-256 hashes. And that's, yeah, that's kind of understandable. Uh, on the other hand, it's, um, it means that uh, having those mechanisms available do doesn't necessarily mean that people will use them. And there was a, there was a phishing demonstration in 2011 where as an, as, an, as an experiment under, cons uh, under controlled circumstances, a professor at a local college set up this uh, phishing page, which looked like the real page, and tried to get 
information about the return codes from the voting cards from the voters. And that's the key piece of information which links the voter to the SMS uh, verification. And that was, no, that was no problem because phishing works, right? And so you have these kind of, you have these kind of problems. Uh, you also have the entire complex regarding secure software development and also, of course, running an online system and keeping it secure, which we know is hard. And so, because of this, before the 2013 election, it was decided to run uh, a technical review. So I think a problem here was that even though the source code was public, uh, it didn't really get a lot of public scrutiny. And the project didn't really succeed in making the tech community engage with this. And after the fact, I was reminded a bit of this when, when the Heartbleed uh, bug showed up earlier this year, in the sense that, uh, kind of like OpenSSL, you have this huge bit of security critical code, and it's open, but uh, the barrier for somebody to actually look at it is kind of high. And there were a few exceptions. There was this phishing experiment that I talked about. There was also uh, a report on code quality, which actually was quite simple. There were a couple of researchers who just ran some automated tools and saw that they got a lot of flags and did some basic analysis of those findings. And it gave an indication that the quality of the source code might not be very good. But uh, anyway, the project wanted to get more information, and so I got this assignment to, to perform a third-party review of uh, the cryptographic primitives in, in key generation implementations. And there were some quite uh, big constraints on this review. Uh, one of those constraints was the, was the time frame, because this was in the summer of 2013, and the election was in September. And uh, if we were to find something and actually do something about it, uh, there was a, quite a limited time frame to do it. Uh, there was also a question of manpower, because it was in the middle of summer vacation in Norway, and so I did this analysis by myself uh, in, a in a limited time span. I would have loved to involve more people and done much more work on it, but basically the resources weren't available. And so I got this assignment, and I said, okay, what does this thing look like? Well, there's a subversion repository, so first thing you do, grab the code. Uh, second thing you do, try to build the code and discover that the code doesn't build. <laughs> And um, apparently there were, uh, there were also some uptime and availability issues with repository because this was uh, clearly not a main priority to keep online. It, it was online, it was nice to have online, but also because of the limited interest, that wasn't the main focus, and particularly not in the middle of summer. And so, okay, next thing you do, you start to look at the system documentation and you see the deployment diagram, and it looks like this. And so... It's kind of a problem that uh, for security systems you want to keep things simple. Uh, <laughs> uh, for internet voting you need to keep things a little bit complicated because you need to keep everything separate. And so here you have a whole bunch of systems doing different stuff. Uh, several of the servers here are air-gapped, but this is just a huge amount of complexity right here. And so... You look a bit more closely at the code, you see this, oh, it's 200,000 lines of Java. And, and that's, uh, and that's uh, source lines. That's no, uh, no comments, no white space, no unit tests, and I think also the modules that are not actually used are excluded. So it's, it's quite big. This is, uh, this is code which is part of the project. It's not third-party libraries. Uh, these are kind of also approximate sizes, because when I was looking at the source code, I found out that it was sometimes quite hard to determine whether a specific uh, Java class was part of the production system or not. Uh, that was actually quite hard to figure out. And I had a recurring problem trying to map the high-level description of the system to the source code, because that wasn't really well documented. And so, okay, okay, next thing, thing you do, you run some automated tools. Somebody had done it before, so I did it again. And you, 
this is only from parts of the code base, and there are, I, I don't think you can read it, but there are several hun hundreds, uh, several hundred yellow or red findings from Findbugs, which says that, okay, this might not be critical, but it's um, pretty clear that the dev team is not using automated tools proactively. And so, actually, the hard part here is that you get so many warnings that it's hard to determine which ones are serious and which ones are, can be ignored. And so, it looks kind of perfect. Uh, just, for, just from this high-level analysis, you, you get some kind of idea that uh, the complexity of the security system is, is quite high. So... To summarize some of the findings from just going on the code safari, uh, there's some trouble with the separation between the security logic and sort of the, the business logic, the, the sort of voting process implementation. Uh, as I said earlier, I had trouble mapping the high-level design to the implementation. And also because the project used Spring and it used dependency injection, it was quite hard to, to read the code and to see what was actually going on, because you had all these dependencies to, to configuration and runtime setup. Uh, basically, it's pretty heavy lifting just to get into the code. And my focus was not the code in general, but the crypto. Well, there's a huge amount of crypto here. And so there's a huge amount of low-level crypto. And it's quite clear that the developers who made the system clearly know a lot about crypto. But the problem is that when you have this sort of copy and paste development and um, you have code all over the place, it's not consistent. And uh, it's, it makes it very hard to, to audit. It makes it definitely very hard to verify anything. Uh, and you get this separation between the system, which is either obviously secure or not obviously insecure. And so, so one of the examples was that... Uh, I can get to that later, I think. There was also some kind of this sort of enterprise software syndrome. I'm, I've been working on quite a lot of big enterprise software projects, and this looked suspiciously like one of those. And so, uh, it's difficult to establish and enforce uh, sort of technical quality metrics in this kind of code basis, and uh, it's kind of unclear what, what are the appropriate quality and assurance levels for critical code. So, looking at some of the bugs. So this was some code in, uh, in a method called Cypher Symmetrically, which was used to, exp to, to password encrypt the security token for export to disk. And so the really bad thing here is that there's actually a developer hand coding this thing. Uh, and there, there are some kind of strange things here, like they're using PBKDF2, which is, uh, well, it's more or less what you have available in Java. I'm good. Uh, so, so I guess that's reasonable, even though you might have liked something else. Uh, okay, oh, they're using counter feedback mode with AS. That's, that's kind of interesting, but it's not illegal. Uh, but uh, they have a PBKDF2 iteration count of two, which is kind of bad. Uh, you, should do, you should use something like 10,000. So, which means that uh, the passwords would be uh, quite a lot easier to brute force than they should be. Uh, there's also this factor that they were using a static IV, which meant that uh, basically the encryption was not, uh, you could, uh, the encryption was really not secure because you, you really shouldn't be encrypting with stat static IVs. And so there's also an inconsistency here in that they're suddenly using counter feedback mode and PKC, PKCS7 padding, whereas elsewhere they're using uh, CBC mode and PKCS5 padding. So it's varied. Uh, there was another bug I found which was related to Shamari secret sharing, which is really secure if you implement it right. Uh, actually, it's mathematically, you can prove that it's mathematically secure if it's implemented with proper random numbers and you, you do everything correctly. Uh, but they didn't, so the security proof broke. And so this is a kind of crypto vulnerability that probably couldn't be exploited, but it's, it's a, well, who knows? You would have to analyze it to tell. And then there was a lot of weirdness, such as 
in one place they were using MD5 to, to verify file, file integrity for some temporary files, and, and they were saying that, oh, but the integrity for these temporary files is not really important. And I say, well, mm, but you shouldn't be using MD5 anyway. Uh, there was a really strange custom implementation of data enveloping, so instead of using some sort of standard for st standard encryption envelope to, to, to encrypt data, they were there, there was some custom code for it. Uh, there was a secure audit logger, which was, uh, when I was analyzing the code, I said that, aha, this secure audit logger is not secure against truncation attacks. But then, in this case, this was a problem which was not being solved by crypto. They were solving it by using Splunk to, to gather the logs on the fly. So that uh, e even if you could truncate a log on the server, you, it would be, you, you would catch it in Splunk and, and vice versa. So they, they had actually thought about that. But, uh, so on, uh, during, during key generation, there was some sensitive plain text being written to disk, which was kind of silly. Uh, this was on an air-gapped server, so it would be hard to get to, but maybe you shouldn't write it to disk. Uh, and there's this thing about secure random not being explicitly initialized, so... You you need to trust that your that your OS and your Java implementation is set up correctly to 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 use something sensible. And then finally, there was there was this critical encryption bug which I mentioned, which actually hit the real election. So this this was actually in the JavaScript script to clients, which was not something I audited. But quite honestly, I wouldn't have found this one even if I audited it. But uh, it's kind of like a Debian random bug in, that, in the sense that you got really poor random numbers. And, uh, and so what it meant was that about 30,000 ballots were encrypted with the same randomness instead of unique randomness, which was kind of bad. And it, it was actually caught by the team who were implementing the redundant ballot counter because they were using the system to generate some test data and then they were finding that mm, this test data looks suspiciously similar to itself. <laughs> so, so Wrapping up, some thoughts. Uh, the, the stuff I did here was just a pure uh, source code analysis, and so the system is really too complicated to verify that way. So to do a more realistic test, you should really be uh, interacting with the, with the running code and trying to, trying to figure out which, which interfaces you, you, you can play with. Um, and so I don't actually think anybody uh, tested the sort of resilience of the backend systems to to malware infection or or, or other kind of intrusion. Uh, there were some uh, so so the the project th and talked about uh, the fact that if they wanted to run this on a national level, they wanted to have common criteria certification. But for the pilot, they prepared some documentation, but it didn't go through the certification process. Uh, there was also trouble with late code delivery and, and lack of a really a proper uh, freeze and stabilization pro uh, period, which was also criticized by the OECD ele election observers. Uh, there's also the question about how to involve the tech community. And I think uh, part of the problem is the common reaction, myself included, that no, I don't want to look, with, look at this. I don't want to engage with this kind of project. Uh, but it also means, it means that there's quite a high barrier to entry. Uh, even for techies, if you wanted to try to get into this, it's, it really takes a lot of time and a lot of work to, to understand what's going on, and that's, that's hard to, to deal with. So, so there's a question if, if the project in some way could have improved incentives for, for people to participate. And there's also, I think, a bit of a culture and language barrier uh, inhibiting foreign interests. So even though, even though the source code documentation is in English, a lot of the discourse and context and anal analysis is, is in Norwegian. And Norway is a small country, and people don't necessarily follow what's, what's happening in Norway. So I guess it's also slipped under the radar of quite a few places. And so... It seems like this is the end of internet voting at Norway uh, for now. And as a security expert, electronic voting scares me. And at the same time, I have a little bit mixed feelings about this because this was really, I believe, a good faith attempt at getting it right. And 
uh, we now have a lot. Uh, we, we we've now lost uh, the knowledge and the expertise and the working organization who were working on this project and actually preparing this talk. I was finding that uh, a lot of the links and a lot of the documentation was getting harder to find because of link rot. And obviously, technology marches on elsewhere. Uh, we have electronic voting rolls in Norway, and there's an electronic system for scanning and counting votes. I don't think that's been very heavily analyzed by the security community yet. It probably should be. And internet and computer voting is on the agenda elsewhere as well. And so that's it for me. I'd like to thank you all for coming. Okay, now we have uh, about 10 minutes for questions and answers. Uh, if you have questions, please uh, line up at the microphones. Um, do we have questions from the internet? Yeah, we do. Um, the voter is given this receipt after uh, casting their vote. Does this receipt change when casting a vote again in the same election? And if so, does this not open up an opportunity for vote selling? Um, So the question was whether the return codes, which were sent by SMS, uh, would change during the election and whether that would <coughs> open opportunities for vote selling. And uh, I don't actually know. Uh, I've actually not. I, I actually haven't seen these voting cards because they were only given out in in the municipalities where where they had the trial. Uh, my understanding was that uh, there was a unique random code for each party on the ballot. Uh, corresponding to that voter, which you would get by SMS, and then you can, and then you could verify the SMS with the paper. And uh, I haven't really spent a lot of time time thinking about uh, vote selling scenarios related to that. I, I guess the main safeguard is that you could always go and vote on on the election day on paper as well. Okay, those who are going out, please be uh, quiet so that uh, the question and answers can be understood. So, um, question from microphone two. <coughs> uh, did online voters vote for different parties compared to offline voters? Because this might explain uh, the cancellation of the project. Uh, the question was whether online voters voted for different parties than the, than the offline voters. And as far as I've been able to determine, the answer is no. Uh, statistic, statistically, it was uh, very similar, both on the national level and, and locally in the different municipalities. So it, 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 there didn't seem to be any differences that uh, weren't uh, explainable by other statistical factors. Okay, a uh, question from uh, one. Yeah, uh, I'm just wondering if was there any attempt or what was the procedure when the tenants were selected in the you know the process for selecting who should make the system uh, as to you know vetting who was uh, programming and so on. I mean, the, the persons involved was the and is uh, was that a factor in the selection process or because you know you could say that well this is a pretty sensitive system you know, you're handling sensitive data and uh, you know the security services might want to look into who is uh, actually programming because finding that row in the uh, random num random number generator would be easy to sneak in if you you know you know what you're doing so so the question was whether there was any vetting of the uh, companies doing the software implementation or the people doing the software implementation uh I don't. I don't know. Uh, I, uh, actually, the main uh, the main company implementing the solution was not uh, Norwegian, uh, but I'm not. Uh, I'm not going to name names there. But you can, it's it's all public. You can find it online. But I'm not, I'm not going to name names. Uh, but uh, whether the whether the national security services did any kind of vetting, I don't know. I know that during the tender process, there were five companies uh, bidding for this con uh, contract, and I'm sure. I'm. I hope that. I hope that they thought about that angle as well, but I don't. I don't know anything beyond that. Okay. Uh, question from number three. Hi. First of all, thanks for the talk. Uh, that has been really interesting. 
I have one question. You mentioned that there are nine invalid votes. Um, when I get a paper ballot, uh, I can, you know, willingly make an invalid vote. Um, the, the nine votes, were they invalid because of nobody knows technical bugs or invalid because of, you know, someone voluntarily made like three crosses instead of one cross? Uh, the question was about those invalid, invalid ballots in 2011. That's a very interesting question. I don't, uh, I don't know. Um, I also didn't find any numbers for 2013 regarding uh, whether any ballots were uh, invalid. Uh, I, I, I'm really not sure what's, uh, what happened there. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, one question from the internet. Um, was there any studies of user, users or voters, uh, voters of the understanding of the security mechanism? Also, are there any reports available in English? Uh, so, so the question was if there were any user studies regarding the security mechanisms and also if there were reports available in English. Uh, I think, yeah, I think the answer is yes to both of those. Uh, most of the technical documentation about the system is available in English. Uh, and also, re regarding uh, the political science angle and the user studies, I think it might not be available in English. I know that there, uh, there were several user, user studies and user testing uh, and, and various pol polls of user behavior regarding the uh, verification mechanisms, uh, uh, which, uh, which, uh, which, which is, I think, also the source to the to the fact that a few a few voters are verifying, but not uh, not very many. Uh, I think it's also a valid question to ask how many how many percent of the voters should do a, man a manual verification to get some sort of statistical guarantee. Uh, I don't know. Okay, from number two. Um, are there any countermeasures against an inside attacker, especially can the voter um, verify that there have not been added any additional uh, votes? Uh, I think uh, the, the voter would be able to verify as long as he or she would be able to receive uh, SMS for that number. Uh, as, as for Countermeasures against insider attacks. We we had the election observers, and there were also the fact that they used uh, the secret sharing to split keys, so that you had to have two operators at the same time. And there were, of course, access controls and and so on and so forth, meaning that there was physical security at the site. Okay, from one. Yeah, hi. Uh, so I was wondering if uh, they actually looked at other existing systems, and if you looked at other existing systems. Uh, and and maybe just generally, do you do you think it's a good idea to to try to make a system that doesn't have those failures? Uh, the question is whether I have looked at other systems and whether they had lo looked at other systems and whether it's a good idea to do this. Uh, the project certainly looked at other systems both in uh, both in 2006 uh, during the feasibility study and also up front before they uh, started the project as such. Uh, I have not, I did not have the opportunity to look at a lot of other systems when I was looking at this because I was in a hurry. Um, but of course I'm, I'm familiar with the e-voting e e in, in Estonia and so on. Uh, personally, I don't think this is a good idea, but I think that uh, in order to in order to get that that message through, you have to engage both on the techn technological level, but also on the policy level. Okay, uh, since the time is almost out, one last question from two. Um, yeah, I was wondering if you have any ideas um, about changes to language or workflow used to result in better quality source code. Uh... I think uh, I think from from my point of view as as a cryptographer and an engineer, my my perspective would be to try to isolate and encapsulate the cryptographic code as much as possible. Uh, 
regarding more general software development techniques techniques for for guaranteeing high high quality and uh, and so on and so forth uh, i'm probably not the person to answer <laughs>